Et le, le titre de l'intervention est « L'empathie d'une machine, cinéma et euh, neurosciences ». Et Vittorio Galliese est professeur de physiologie dans le département de neurosciences de la faculté de médecine de l'Université de Parme et directeur de l'école doctorale en médecine de l'Université de, de Parme. Depuis le 2010, il est aussi adjunct research scholar au département de Art History and Archaeology de Columbia University et professeur de Experimental Aesthetics auprès de l'Université uh, of London. Thank you. I wish to start by uh, thanking Mauro Carbone for uh, inviting Michele and me to this very, very interesting meeting. And uh, I owe you the apologies from Michele, who um, couldn't make it. So our two talks were uh, uh, tightly interrelated. So I won't be able to give Michele's talk. I will just show you uh, his slides. But um, if they are not so compelling, the fault is mine because I'm not able uh, uh, to do as well as Michele would certainly have, uh, have done. So I think our talk nicely uh, ties uh, um, with the previous talk. And uh, uh, we are going to address some of the issues that came up uh, during the discussion about uh, the relationship between the screen uh, and the notion of, um, of empathy. By the way, this is Michele hanging around with Claudia Cardinale a few months ago in uh, Parma. So um, here you have a screen carpet, uh, the history of cinema. Some movies are pretty, uh, pretty novel, like this uh, by Villeneuve, and. Um, these are the new screen, and the, the central image is one of the most disturbing for any of us when we stare uh, at the, the white empty screen with this spinning wheel uh, waiting for something to happen, uh, which uh, eventually will never happen. So we relate uh, with screen with a variety of uh, uh, perspectives and mutual relationship. Uh, legend or not, uh, I mean, uh, we all read that uh, um, during the history, uh, the beginning of the history of film, people could, uh, if not believe, conceive the idea that this image uh, would produce uh, something like, like this, uh, which is a real footage of uh, a locomotive uh, uh, breaking the walls of, I think it's Gare du Lyon, I, I guess. Or um, looking for something happening uh, behind uh, the screen, like this uh, shot from a movie from 1902, I think. Or with augmented reality being inside uh, of the screen. So, so far we have been dealing with relationship between bodies and screens. So the screen uh, with this uh, position, with this physical, physical spatial location, like in this particular case, you can mirror yourself by looking at this shot from uh, Dreamers uh, by uh, Bernardo Bertolucci. But with the introduction of a uh, novel portable screen, the relationship can be completely subverted. So an alien creature who doesn't know anything about a selfie uh, would uh, uh, wonder why the main event being here, or all the bystander turn their back just to take uh, a picture of themselves within the screen uh, together with Hillary. So as Laguerre uh, wrote recently, the spectator is the one whose consciousness can both realize the concrete material reality of the cinematic apparatus, realizing consciousness, and project itself imaginatively into the ongoing film, imaging consciousness, without leaving its psychophysical base, so to speak. My capacity to divide and duplicate my imaginary self explains how the base can maintain its state of sameness, so that my subjectivity can simultaneously locate itself aesthetically in the film while remaining itself." End of quote. 
And now you realize why I choose to give my talk in English uh, and not in French. Here is a quote from Feldman. Well, I should really say part of my friends. Uh, le film réclame du spectateur ce qui semble à première vue impossible. Se transporter sans l'aide d'excitants, de stupéfiants, ni de modifications psychophysiologiques engendrées par la surprojection lumineuse dans une situation irréelle, tout en demeurant dans la situation réelle de la salle, un être éveillé qui croit à la réalité du film qu'il absorbe. Uh, we have been dealing with the, the situation of the empty screen, the black screen or the white screen, like in this particular image from uh, Arrival, uh, the last movie by uh, Villeneuve. And this is the image I was mentioning before, even uh, bringing along a, a lot of anxiety, because it violates uh, the temporal expectation. Uh, we are looking at this rectangle, waiting for something to happen, which it doesn't in this particular case. And here we have two parallel quotes by Maxim Gorky about the absence of life uh, and uh, the fullness of life in these two extreme conditions with the blank screen and the screen populated by the diegetic world narrated by the movie. Vous n'avez plus devant les yeux qu'un simple morceau d'étoile blanche tendu dans un large cadre noir qui semble n'avoir jamais rien porté à sa surface. Quelqu'un a dû susciter dans votre imagination ce que vos yeux ont cru voir une indéfinissable foi sympa de vous. But, but when uh, life is on the screen, life becomes present. Uh, c'est la vie même, c'est le mouvement pris sur le vif. Quelle que soit la scène, ainsi prise, et si grand que soit le nombre de personnages, ainsi surpris dans le acte de leur vie, vous les revoyez avec toute l'illusion de la vie réelle. Vos nerfs s'étendant, votre imagination vous étreint dans une vie étrange, artificiellement uniforme, privée de couleurs et de son, mais pleine de mouvements. We are one year after the invention of film, 1896. And uh, Jean Epstein, uh, a movie director and a scholar of film that both Michele and I am beaucoup, uh, tous les systèmes compartimentés de la nature se trouvent désarticulés. Il ne reste plus qu'un règne, la vie. And uh, the peculiar relationship uh, between ourselves and the images on the screen are beautifully captured by this metaphorical, I would say, shot uh, uh, um, at the opening of Berman Persona, which probably um, is quoted by Villeneuve uh, in his last uh, arrival. Pour savoir si un film uh, a une action sur la pensée et le sentiment, qui se traduisant par des mouvements, on dispose de l'élément artistique inscrit. Si l'on peut enregistrer le phénomène physiologique correspondant, il est possible d'étudier l'excitant et la réaction dans les conditions où se fait une bonne expérience. This is a quote from Edouard Toulouse, and Toulouse uh, is a forerunner of what we are trying to do with our uh, more expensive uh, um, toys uh, that we keep in the lab namely a physiology of a film experience. Here is a quote from Toulouse and Morgue. Le film agit très puissement sur la vie affective car le sentiment de réalité dû au mouvement dans les trois dimensions de l'espace évoluant dans une décor souverain réel y est très intense. Quelle est la source essentielle de ce sentiment de réalité? We, we are still debating uh, with this question. Il nous paraît devoir être rattaché à la suggestibilité motrice de nos sujets. And again, la perception du mouvement fait naître, comme on le sait, l'ébauche du mouvement correspondant. C'est de ce côté, croyons-nous, qu'il faut chercher une des raisons psychologiques du grand succès de représentation 
cinématographique parmi les masses populaires. So we have a specific focus on the relevance of movement. And this le gauche du mouvement correspondant uh, can be seen as a kind of prophetical uh, 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 thought about uh, something that uh, was not yet uh, described or discovered, namely motor resonance and uh, mirror neurons. So Christian Voss, elaborating on uh, uh, film experience and the relationship between body and screen, wrote, my thesis is that it is only the spectator's body in its mental and sensorial affective resonance with the events on the screen which loans a three-dimensional body to the screen and thus flips the second dimension of the film event over into the third dimension of the sensing body. The spectator thus becomes a temporary surrogate body for the screen and this body is for its part, a constituent feature of the filmic architecture. The point, one of the few points I want to make today is that we don't need to entertain the idea of our body facing the screen as a surrogate body. It's our body, the body that we carry along uh, all, um, all day, that uh, enable us to uh, empathize, relate, with the bidimensional characters on screen uh, with a very thin difference uh, um, concerning what's going on in our brain body when we are looking at real life uh, uh, with respect to when we are looking uh, at uh, uh, the bidimensional rendition. Murray Smith recently wrote, it is hard to escape the brain these days and this may be a sad truth for many of you uh, although uh, this uh, statement needs uh, badly uh, qualification, because it is not enough to look at the brain, it much depends on what kind of question you ask uh, to the brain. And let's move to the second part of the talk. Now I'm fully responsible for what you Okay, let's start with uh, uh, Colin McGinn. The mind-body problem is the problem of explaining how conscious experience relates to the physical materials of the body and the brain, while the mind-movie problem is the problem of explaining how is that the two-dimensional moving image, as we experience it in a typical feature film, managed to hook our consciousness in the way it does. Mauro Carbone, Le Visuel et Le Visible, la théorie filmique, tant classique et contemporaine, a plutôt présupposé qu'expliquer la nature intrasubjective et intersubjective de l'expérience filmique, sa fonction transitive et sa performance communicative. And I believe that uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience hand in hand uh, with film scholars and film theory can, can address finally this topic uh, by adding a, a new level of description, a new perspective that nevertheless can be traced back in the debate, in the historical debate on images on film. So there's never something completely new and uh, it will uh, emerge uh, during my talk. So some of the questions uh, um, I want to start with are the following. Which strategies do movies employ to involve viewers, making them empathize with the characters on the screen or not empathize uh, uh, with the characters on screen? And um, we should not, uh, today we are uh, discussing empathy, but uh, many, many movies uh, work the other way around. Uh, they specifically try uh, to keep uh, ourselves at a distance. I'm thinking about uh, uh, the trilogy by Antonioni, uh, where um, the idea is exactly to convey the impossibility uh, to feel at once with the world. Uh, Monica Vitti uh, uh, um, has this wonderful uh, uh, mo. Uh, in order to feel the world, I need to touch it. She touches physically uh, the wall uh, with her hand. Uh, 
And the hypothesis I'd like to discuss with you is that this functional mechanism embodied simulation that I will uh, 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 shortly address may generate the peculiar quality of the embodied scene as that uh, uh, plays a significant role in our aesthetic experience and among others our aesthetic experience of film. Uh, the hypothesis being that this mechanism is one important ingredient of our empathic engagement with human creative expression as in our filmic experience. So the point is by asking questions to this specific object uh, uh, um, to verify whether we can come up with something relevant and mm, sensible uh, within the debate, um, the ongoing debate. So why mirror neurons? Mirror neurons are neurons, they are not magic cells, they are motor cells that enable a, a direct connection to be established between the agent and uh, another uh, 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 individual who may be witnessing what the agent uh, uh, is doing. So, namely, uh, the neuron that fires each of these tiny little dots is a single action potential recorded from this specific neuron whenever the uh, macaque uh, performs a goal-related motor acts like grasping an object but also when the macaque is not doing anything but looking at someone else uh, performing a similar action in front of it. And um, when we discovered mirror neurons, we were the actors physically performing actions in front of the macaque. This is a, most, uh, a more recent experiment where a comparison is being made Still recording single neurons, but comparing this time the impact on the discharge of this neuron when the action is uh, physically uh, executed in front of the macaque. So there is a, a physical body, the experimenter performing the action, or the action is filmed and uh, uh, the macaque is looking at the action by merely looking at the bidimensional screen. And um, basically, half of the neuron approximately uh, are not selective. They respond equally well, like this particular neuron, both when uh, uh, the macaque is uh, uh, looking at someone physically executing the action in the room, or when watching uh, the video uh, um, displaying the very same action. Other neurons in a, approximately an equal uh, 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 percentage do prefer the naturalistic action, like this one. The discharge is significantly stronger when the mock is looking at the real person with respect to when uh, looking at the same person performing the action on a screen. And a tiny minority uh, of neurons prefer the bidimensional image, which is probably a, a byproduct of the intense training the monkey had to go through in order to convince the macaque to pay attention to this bidimensional screen. So, this is very interesting because it shows you, even down at the level of single neuron, that the difference between something really happening in front of me with respect to something which is a filming of something that might have happened or not uh, um, is basically the same. There is a very tiny difference between the two. So let's let's leave the uh, singe behind and let's uh, address what we are really interested in uh, ourselves, our brain. So this cartoon is showing you which part of our brain turn out to be activated both when we execute but also when we witness action, movements uh, uh, performed by others. The uh, motor resonance palette, so to speak, if you allow me the expression, in the human brain is much wider with respect to the monkey. Even gratuitous movements like raising my arm, jumping, or communicative uh, action like waving goodbye, say stop, or go away, uh, I could continue. 
uh, with my uh, Italian uh, bagage of uh, gestural uh, expressions, uh, it's wider. And this is probably one of the uh, reasons why we are uh, uh, really the, uh, the mimetic creatures. Uh, we say uh, to him, to, um, in Italian we say scimmiotare, Germans say affen, English say to ape, in France you say what? You don't, okay. Sanger, Sanger. But uh, monkeys are very poor imitators. In order to imitate, you need uh, uh, a neural machinery that enables you not only uh, to identify the goal, and Sanja are pretty happy with that, but even the idiosyncratic way uh, that uh, is required to accomplish that very same goal. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about imitation, but emulation. And this probably is this combination of a motor resonance, which is not only goal related, but also movement related might be um, one of the explanations why we are the real mimetic uh, um, species. Pretty early on, I had the impression that this mechanism that we uh, revealed in the domain of action could be the tip of a much bigger iceberg. And indeed, 17 years ago, as we speak, Alvin Goldman and I, in a short paper, proposed that that there might have been other resonance mechanisms not confined to the domain of action, but also in the domain of emotion and sensations. And speaking about emotion, in 2003, uh, the color code is not coincidental. This experiment was done uh, uh, with a French colleague in Marseille. Uh, this is a parasagittal cut of the human brain. This is the insula, this is the frontal pole, the occipital pole, the cerebellum. This anterior part of the insula is activated both when we feel genuine disgust. We were uh, uh, having the volunteers in the scanner inhaling disgusting odorants because uh, we wanted to uh, really generate uh, the feeling of disgust. Uh, in another condition, they were watching short video clips showing actors uh, pretending to be disgusted. And uh, the white uh, pixels uh, portray the part of the insula that activate in both situation. Okay, so for my disgust, but also for your disgust. And then I, 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 I can hear the objection growing, but if it's the same, it's not empathy because uh, the alterity of the other is lost. But the alterity of the other is perfectly preserved. So what we have here is a, a sort of a, a pilot of a very complex uh, uh, dynamic uh, uh, mechanism of brain connectivity. So this anterior spot in the insula activate no matter whose disgust is at stake. However, this area connects specifically with different brain region when it is my disgust, which are different with respect to when I am witnessing the disgust of someone else. So there is something shared which, according to my hypothesis, brings in the feeling uh, of my experience when witnessing someone else's disgust. The, the experiential feeling which qualifies as truly empathic if we follow Edith Stein's rendition of Ein Fulung, but at the same time preserves the alterity because this focus is coupled with other brain regions that uniquely activate for my disgust, but not for your disgust. This is a more recent paper from uh, a former PhD student of mine realizing in Guarda Hospital in Milano on epileptic patients. Just before the surgery, for a couple of weeks, uh, in order for the neurosurgeon to remove only and exclusively the epileptogenic uh, focus in the brain, intraparenchymal electrodes are implanted. Uh, they are left there for a week or two, the time required to specifically localize uh, the epileptogenetic uh, uh, um, region of the brain. It has to be removed. Through this electrode, you can record stereo AG, but you can also uh, deliver uh, stimulation. You can directly stimulate those brain regions. 
and by directly stimulating the anterior cingulate cortex, my colleagues were able to evoke both laughter and not only the motoric expression of uh, laughter, but also the, uh, the feeling of mirth, of being uh, uh, in, a, in a good mood. Interestingly enough, this brings in uh, uh, a hot topic uh, in the current debate about uh, what emotions really are. And our take on this issue is the following. Emotional experiences such as mirth and merriment can be evoked by stimulating frontal areas which traditionally are deemed to control the motor output, including this specific area which I show you, the pregenual anterior cingulate cortex, the supplementary motor area, and the inferior frontal gyrus. So it follows that the neural system supporting emotional production, the way emotion are expressed, and those that enable the subjective experience of the very same emotion, largely overlap, thus diffusing the experience, expression, dualism, and newly find the need for serial processing in the emotional brain. I don't have time to go deeper in this, but uh, what I found as probably the most interesting theory of emotion compatible uh, uh, with what we know about uh, the brain is buried inside uh, the man without qualities in the second part of the man without qualities there is a very long it's an essay actually in his diary he uh, Musil uh, complains that had he accepted the, the academic position Stumpf was offering him he, he wouldn't have been forced to stuff his novel with this boring uh, <laughs> uh, non-fiction like uh, and uh, but I don't have time. But if you reread that part, uh, uh, you will find some, some connection with uh, uh, what I've told you. And he, this is an even more recent paper showing that the very same area whose stimulation produces laughter and merriment also uh, is activated when witnessing uh, the laughter uh, performed on a bidimensional screen by someone else. So it's a still indirect but very compelling uh, uh, neurophysiological evidence of uh, a mirror mechanism uh, uh, for positive emotions. But this is not confined to emotion but also to sensation. Again, uh, this very first experiment was also done in collaboration with Bruno Wicker in Marseille. We didn't have uh, an fMRI machine back then, uh, basically here we are confronting what's happening in the brain of the volunteers, confronting a situation where their legs were being touched with a situation where they look at the legs of someone else being touched on a bidimensional video. And one of the brain areas that normally map our tactile sensation, the second somatosensory area here, is activated both when we experience touch but also when we witness the touch of someone else. So this led us in the book uh, to formulate the hypothesis that close-ups, particularly in body shots, emphasize the textural and material quality of the image, boosting visual tactile mirroring uh, and affective embodied simulation in maximizing uh, uh, spectators engagement and we are currently working on the haptic quality of digital images in our lab. So there are mirror neurons but uh, uh, we should probably speak uh, of something broader, a mirror mechanism, which maps the sensory representation of the actions, emotion or sensations of others onto the perceiver's own motor, visceral motor or somatosensory representation of that action, emotion, or sensation. And the idea is that this mapping enables one to perceive the action, emotion, or sensation of another from within, so to speak. So, why embodied? Because it involves a non-linguistic form of representation. 
And uh, our idea is that this model provides a unitary account of basic aspects of social cognition, of intersubjectivity, showing that we reuse our own mental states or processes represented with a bodily format in functionally attributing uh, them to others. So both self and other appear to be intertwined because of the intercorporeality linking them, and we didn't have to wait neuroscience to discover that, of course. Intercorporeality describes a crucial aspect of intersubjectivity because we and others share the same intentional objects and our situated sensory motor system are similarly wired to accomplish similar goals. Uh, so, film experience and empathy, the role of embodiment. This is the book, The uh, Empathic Screen, L'Ecran Empathique. Uh, and we can begin but with uh, Mauro and with Merleau-Ponty. Merleau-Ponty establishes une affinité essentielle entre le fonctionnement de notre perception visuelle et la production du mouvement par la technique cinématographique. Now I commit something that you should never do in France. I quote Merleau-Ponty in English, but I didn't have time to uh, translate, re uh, propose the original French. If we now consider the film as a perceptual object, wrote uh, Merleau-Ponty in Sense and Nonsense, we can apply what we have just said about perception in general to the perception of a film. And we have seen several examples in the few uh, bits of neuroscience. I, I quickly show you that this is true also, even at the level not only of the brain, but down at the level of single neurons. L'imaginaire, right, Carbone, Orion, et Taliban, notre regard, et nous faisons voir l'actuel, tout comme la précession de l'actuel sur l'imaginaire. De cette manière, le primat de l'un de deux termes sous l'autre devient indécidable. I think this is a crucial aspect uh, uh, of what we are seeing by trying to understand uh, filmic experience by asking questions to the brain. Cinematic meaning does not depend just on concept and proposition, but also relies on sensory motor and affective schemas, which get the viewer literally in touch with the screen, shaping a multimodal form of simulation which exploits all the potentialities of our brain-body system. And we decided to start to keep it as simple as possible. So our first experiment was dealing with camera movements. We were basically shooting an actor, looking at an object and grasping it with a steady camera, with a dolly, with a zooming lens and with a steady cam. So the cameraman was walking uh, uh, toward the scene. We matched the speed of the approach with the lens, with the dolly and uh, so we try to keep all the low-level psychophysic element of the three moving images uh, as equal as possible. And we didn't ask anything to our participants, but told them, please look at the screen and try not to move uh, uh, as much as you can. At the end of the experiment, we asked them many questions about the material we, we presented to them. So you see, it's very simple, a fixation cross, a short video clip for three seconds, then we had catch tries, but I don't need to go into these technicalities, and then five seconds of a blank screen. The Steadicam won. The Steadicam showed the stronger activation of the motor system of the viewers in all conditions and in all epochs. So it is the Steadicam which evokes the strongest motor resonance in the viewers. Uh, brain body, as witnessed by this complete image. I, I don't need to go into the details. Participants perceive the movements of the Steadicam as being the most natural and most resembling the movements of an approaching observer, thus eliciting the feeling that the observer herself would walk towards the scene. So what we have here is probably a double simulation. The simulation of the action performed by the actor on screen and the simulation of the movement of the eye of the camera 
walking along with the body of the cameraman, which is a technique used by many directors uh, uh, to give spectators the feeling of this uh, bodily immanence, uh, like uh, in uh, uh, the famous scenes uh, of Danny on the tricycle uh, in the hotel, in The Shining, uh, where uh, uh, the Steadicam follows uh, the trajectory of the, of the young kid uh, and keeps walking in the empty corridor even after uh, uh, the tricycle and then it disappears uh, behind, uh, behind the corner, giving us the impression that we are looking through the eyes of a, a mysterious spooky presence uh, which uh, uh, holds uh, the, this hotel. Okay, how realistic did you find the camera movement, the steady cam wins? How much did you feel the camera movement resemble the person movement when approaching the scene? Not surprisingly, the steady cam wins again. And this uh, is the, the second experiment we published. This was on uh, cuts, movie cuts, where we confronted uh, uh, a standard way of uh, editing a scene with a violation of the 180 degree rule. When in the second scene you place the camera on the other side so that if in the first shot you have two actors talking to one another, in the next shot they will be flipping uh, by 180 degrees. It can be used, it has been used, it is constantly used uh, uh, this violation for the ejectic purposes. How am I, am I doing with that? It's okay? okay. But don't tell me it's okay because I can't go on. No, 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 no how much? I'm gonna tell you okay, ten minutes, well, 10 minutes before. Fantastic. Okay, so what we discover here uh, is that uh, when people are looking at the edited sequence which violates the 180 degree rule, we were able to detect uh, an event related potential, an ERP as we call it which has been described previously in the literature. And this ERP, this event-related potential, was described when people commit errors in performing actions. So the idea is that uh, this specific editing is treated by our motor brain as a violation of a sort of motor syntactical non-linguistic rule. This is the idea. What we are actually analyzing uh, is uh, the experiment uh, we need uh, to support the hypothesis I was mentioning before that in the previous experiment we had two simulations at once. The body simulation of the action performed by the actor on screen plus the simulation of the movement of the cameraman moving the eye of the, uh, of the camera, of the steadicam. So we have shown two individuals uh, video clips uh, performed with a steady camera, with the dolly, with the zooming lens, and with the steady camera, but the room is empty. There's no action, there's no actor, there's no body to be uh, simulated, to empathize with, just the different optical uh, 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 moving um, uh, obtained through the zoom, the dolly, or the steady camera. And our working hypothesis is that even in such a way, we will be able to uh, detect an activation in the motor system of the viewers, uh, specifically being strongest uh, when evoked by the movement of the um, steadicam. Data analysis is ongoing, so I can't anticipate, but I can anticipate that we are fairly optimistic about the outcome of this experiment. And this is an experiment is going to uh, be done in uh, very shortly in a cinema, in a small cinema theater in Berlin, uh, where we will confront video clips taken from different movies, conveying different emotions, anger, uh, sadness, fear, and merriment, being watched by participants in two conditions, alone in the movie theater or in the company with others. And our prediction is that the sharing of the experience will affect uh, the way their autonomic system, the heartbeat, the blood pressure, their galvanic skin response will be affected, but not unspecifically, but possibly 
in different ways for the different emotions uh, uh, to be watched, uh, uh, looking at this uh, famous film, video clips. Then, something which is, I think, quite relevant to the topic we, we will be discussing during these two days, uh, we are interested, we are very curious in confronting the response of the brain and body of spectators when the very same field content uh, is perceived on a big screen, on our laptop, on an iPad, or on a smartphone. This is an experiment that we have, uh, the data collection has been completed. We did it in Venice uh, with the support of Prada Foundation. So we have 12 actors performing two different monologues uh, in uh, basically two conditions, alone in front of the camera or in front of uh, an audience uh, uh, with people sitting two meters away from them. And we recorded the facial display of emotion with infrared thermal imaging. We recorded the autonomic response of the audience and of the actor. And in a forthcoming experiment, we will show the field footage of the very same monologues performed by the very same uh, actors to a different audience. So, and this is a very crude uh, and uh, a coarse attempt to compare theater and, and cinema. We are very interested in the interplay between uh, emotion and music and uh, something Michele and I, uh, uh, we are um, organizing, is the attempt to replicate the Kuleshov effect uh, by replacing uh, uh, um, the images with different uh, music, with different uh, uh, emotional uh, uh, color. And finally, uh, uh, optic vision. So far, we have been dealing not with bodies, but with abstract images, playing with the resolution uh, of those images and uh, uh, recording uh, uh, eye tracking. Uh, so how people explore these different digital images and how their autonomic system responds. But I'm even more interested in comparing uh, uh, close-ups and um, I would be very curious to compare close-ups in silent movie and in uh, um, Hollywood movies. I think they have the active quality is very different. Okay, just I will so far what I told you as nothing relevant from an aesthetic point of view, strictly speaking. Actually, I overemphasized how. Tiny is the border between real-life immersion and immersion with fictional narrative. But there is, um, otherwise we would be in a, in a, in a white room uh, with our arms tied up. Uh, there is a, clearly a way uh, to tell the difference between narrative fiction and, uh, and, and reality. So I would like to spend the very last part of my talk addressing uh, this topic of the aesthetic insularity of our aesthetic experience, in particular of our aesthetic experience of film. So how can cinema have so powerful a reality effect when it's so manifestly unreal, was asking um, a few years ago, Steven Shaviro in The Cinematic Body. Or, oh, in other words, more broadly speaking, why is artistic fiction sometimes more powerful, even more powerful, uh, than real life in evoking our emotional engagement and empathic involvement? I spent a substantial part of my uh, Christmas holidays uh, binge watching Downton Abbey and uh, um, locked up in my room, uh, uh, not to be seen uh, uh, in tears. <laughs> it's, um, topic moment. So it's fake, it's, it's a fiction, it's not even art, so to speak. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, the type of art uh, that we recognize in Epstein or Eisenstein or in Truffaut or whatever, but still is so powerful, even more powerful than real life. In spite of the fact that the body is at the core of our perception, of our understanding and of our imagination, the relationship with fictional words is still mainly explained in purely cognitive terms. In a way, we are left uh, with the old uh, uh, say of Coleridge, uh, 
It's a suspension of disbelief. It's fake, but I pretend it to be true. I just turn on or off, as you prefer, a cognitive switch, and for the next two hours, I pretend it to be true. Is this all there is in our engagement with narrative, with fictional uh, narrative? I don't think so. Embodied simulation, uh, this is the hypothesis I, I would like to discuss with you, can be relevant to our experience of fictional worlds because of the feeling of body they evoke by means of the potentiation of the mirroring mechanism they activate. So the idea is that there is a boosting of this mechanism and the boosting is uh, somehow related with the ability of the creator to have uh, the reader, the bystander, the beholder, uh, the spectator engaged. In such a way, embodied simulation generates a specific attitude in forming our aesthetic experience. Such potentiation supposedly boosts the bodily memories and imaginative association fictional content can awake in our minds, thus providing the idiosyncratic character of its appreciation. Aesthetic experience, in other words, besides being a suspension of disbelief, can be also interpreted as a sort of liberated embodied simulation. Liberated from what? When we adopt an aesthetic stance, like when going to the movie theater, we are forced to lose an our grip on the world, liberating new energies that up to that moment were not fully available because we are constantly ungarred, so to speak, in real life. We must be prepared to fight, to flight. So we devote a lot of resources to be uh, in a sort of alert mood, which is released when we sit on our couch watching a, a film in TV, when we pay a ticket and, and uh, go to a movie theater, when we go to a museum and, and behold uh, a painting. Although it happened in my life that this uh, uh, um, feeling of being safe was violated. I was with my dad. It must have been the seven, early 70s. 69 or 70, uh, I was 10 or 11, we were watching Green Berets with John Wayne and all of a sudden people entered uh, um, the side and started shouting against uh, America, against Nixon. They were manifesting uh, uh, um, in favor of the Vietnamese people. And so the movie had to be interrupted and we gently uh, pushed out. But this happened only once in my life, so to speak. So, in aesthetic experience, we are free to love, hate, be afraid, but always from a safety distance, okay? And this safety distance and our being still, like in dreams, enable us to maximize our connectedness to the fictional world. Uh, here's a quote from a wonderful book by Edgar Morin, uh, the cinema uh, or the imaginary man. For the spectator, deep in his cell, a monad closed off to everything except the screen, enveloped in the double placenta of an anonymous community and obscurity, where the emphasis is mine, when the channels for action are blocked, then the locks to myth, dream, and magic are opened up. So immobility, that is a greater degree of motor inhibition, likely allows us to allocate more neural resources, intensifying the activation of bodily formatted representation and in so doing, making us adhere more intensely to what we are simulating. Being forced to inaction, we are more open to feelings and emotions. The specific and particularly moving experience generated when immersed in fictional worlds is thus likely also driven by this sense of safe intimacy with the world we not only imagine but also literally embody. And I later on discovered, through the help of Michele Cometa, that again this is by no means new, this idea of liberated embodied simulation can be traced back to the notion of Entlastung put forward by uh, uh, philosophical anthropology and specifically by Arnold Galen. 
Arnold Gale wrote in uh, Man is Nature and Place in the World, man's special biological condition to be a not determined animal and to be exposed to uncertainty and anxiety about the environment and the future make it necessary that he severe his ties to the world from the immediate present. The end result of this process is that man creates great symbol fields in vision, language, and imagination, which provide him with indication as to how to behave most effectively. Furthermore, the motor functions are relieved and put at rest, but they can easily be employed toward any desired end if the course of action man decides to pursue requires it. So, and I, I'm really finished. Movement, space, action, objects, characters, position, and behaviors make the film a place of virtual interaction and a sophisticated form of mediated intersubjectivity. These elements are connected to the function of embodied simulation. The ways through which the viewer is involved in the story are not just offline mental processes, like analytic philosopher in the field of simulation theory would put it, but primarily online bodily forms of intersubjectivity. The intercorporeality implied by embodied simulation represents a valid starting point to analyze the mode of presence of cinema and to shed new light on viewers' responses. And uh, therefore, liberated embodied simulation might contribute to address both the issue of fictionality and of aesthetic insularity. This is a very complicated issue. I don't think neuroscience can provide any final answer to any of the questions we'll be debating during these two days or people have been debated since the invention of cinema. I think we need to be humble, we need to work in tight collaboration with the experts in the fields, the people who are sitting here, but I think uh, we have a chance, if you like, as we say in Italian, uh, riscoprire l'acqua calda, uh, to rediscover hot water, <laughs> or to sell uh, an old wine in a new bottle, I think the major advantage of this approach is that can free the table uh, from issues that we don't want to discuss anymore because they are not relevant. I think it can help us better focusing on what really matters when we want to understand who we are. So experimental aesthetics, which is one of my line of research, can help us in better understanding the complexity of our film experience, making clear that processes of making meaning are not only confined to the domain of the cognitive, but also grow out of the bodily and precognitive contact between us and the field. And uh, to finish with the uh, uh, consideration inactuelle, can you say that? I want to quote one of the inventors of physiognomy, uh, Georg uh, Christoph Lichtenberg, because this quote, I think, captures uh, many of the things I try to tell you today. Our body stands in between our soul and the external world, mirroring the effects of both. And I want to finish by thanking all the people that made uh, uh, this presentation possible. Christina uh, Berkio, who is now in Genève, David Friedberg, Michele Guerra, Catherine Hyman, who is now in Aarhus, uh, uh, Beatrice Bricia Fioretti, uh, Maria Teresa Sestito, who is now in Ohio, and uh, Maria Alessandra Umiltà, who is still also my wife, uh, uh, not only a colleague. Thank you so much. Merci, merci beaucoup à vous, Victor Gallese, pour cette euh, intervention très très riche qui a su relier si bien des questions de la théorie et de l'anthropologie du cinéma aux neurosciences, faisant que les deux s'interrogent mutuellement. Et maintenant, je vous laisse euh, l'interroger mutuellement. Euh, Mao, euh, je... s'il y a quelqu'un qui peut me dire merci.
vous poser ma question en français Alors, merci beaucoup, merci pour euh, toute la richesse de cette euh, présentation et la partie qui concerne euh, Michel Eguerre et, et ta propre partie. Je, je voudrais te demander quelque chose qui croise les deux. C'est-à-dire, tu as montré euh, dans la première euh, partie de euh, diapo de Michel, si j'ai bien compris, euh, qui montrait euh, euh, deux euh, situations de l'écran. Euh, L'une était intitulée « Absence of life ». Yes. And the other one was uh, uh, titled The Presence of Life. J'étais en train de, de penser que, et c'est quelque chose que je, euh, Reilly, euh, à, à, se relie à ma question euh, adressée à Mildred, j'étais en train de penser qu'il y a peut-être euh, une euh, troisième. Euh, situation que j'appellerais euh, imminence euh, euh, de vie. Hein? Imminence de vie. Oui. C'est-à-dire, l'écran est euh, empty, euh, mais j'ai euh, cette quoi, sensation, émotion, ça c'est déjà une question pour toi. Hein? Euh, L'imminence, c'est quoi hum, et, 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 et l'imminence, comment, comment on peut la retrouver au niveau, au niveau de, euh, euh, du cerveau hein? Et, et est-ce que l'imminence est quelque chose qui a à voir avec euh, le passage vers... Euh, The liberated yes mm -hmm. euh, euh, et, et donc euh, vers the aesthetic insularity. Well, let me uh, answer first the first part of your question for the second. Maybe I need some more clarification. So the feeling of imminence, uh, it's uh, something our brain is perfectly equipped with. Now there's a big uh, fuss about anticipatory coding. So our brain and our perceptual apparatus uh, does its best to keep us ahead of what uh, is going to happen in time and space. So you don't want to discover that it's time to run when you're already half uh, eaten by the lion, so to speak. So our perceptual apparatus developed uh, uh, to give us uh, 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 the, the best chances to anticipate what's going on. So in this imminence, uh, which happens also in a concert hall, there is this magic moment when finally no one is coughing anymore, no one is moving uh, on, on, on the chair, the conductor is ready to start and there is this moment of silence which anticipates the development of music and uh, sometimes it, it's even more fascinating this moment it happened to me only maybe maybe once only once uh, with Sergio Ceribidac uh, conducting uh, this this uh, incredible feeling of of tension for something that is going to happen to feel um, our ears our heart but it's, it's not happened uh, yet So I think this deals with the anticipatory architecture of our, of our brain. And from a psychological point of view, the empty screen uh, is uh, clearly, uh, the blank screen is the typical device that you use in order to project your imagination. So to fill it uh, with uh, not only what you anticipate might happen, but Uh, with what you would like uh, to be happening, even if you are not sure. So it's, uh, it's imminence and at the same time indeterminacy. And uh, 
with with the the huge I, I would bet with the huge inter individual variability. All the things I've been dealing with in the part when I was addressing the brain may lead uh, uh, you to believe that uh, we are all wired in the, exactly the same way. To a certain degree, it's true, otherwise we wouldn't understand each other. But as soon as you uh, uh, want to investigate how any individual sujet uh, relate to a given perceptual uh, uh, event or object or whatever, you discover that even when we explicitly describe the thing we were exposed to exactly uh, using the same word, uh, our inner experience most likely is not identical to the degree that we can spot a completely different brain circuit being activated in different individuals. I have not understood the relationship between imminence and uh, aesthetic insularity. In a, in a sense, you already uh, gave uh, your uh, your answer because uh, uh, you spoke about uh, uh, the the anti screen uh, in terms of uh, um, possibility of uh, uh, give uh, give uh, a room to our uh, imagination yes so in this sense uh, the imminence uh, is uh, something like a possible passage to yeah the, yeah, the, the yeah, aesthetic yeah, insularity yeah definitely I think I mean we we, we take for, for granted that uh, in a way our eyes uh, behave like a camera but we tend to forget that out of one minute of vision about I would say, I don't exactly remember the figures, but about 20% of the time is blank. There's nothing to be seen. Why? Because we keep closing our eyes. It's like covering the lens of your camera periodically with your hand. Once you project the film, you see uh, this black interruption. We don't perceive them. So there's a lot of feeling in produced by our brain and body. So perception is always active. Perception in real life uh, and even more the perception of a field. So in that respect I think also uh, neuroscience can help in wiping the table of unwanted uh, uh, conundrum uh, um, or a useless questions that don't need to be answered. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrea Pinotti? Thank you, Vittorio, for your paper. As always, very rich and uh, stimulating. In one of your last slides, um, you characterized film uh, or cinema rather as a place of virtual interaction, mm. and this is related uh, uh, to the nature of the mirror system, which decouples, as you say, or deactivates. Uh, the, the actual response, so it's uh, as if and as if yeah. response uh, Milton as well in her paper on lips spoke of this deactivation of the in, in the Einführung. So you don't need to actually um, have a motor reaction in this. Well, case. it's motor to the extent that uh, it activates part of your motor brain, but it doesn't get to your muscles. Precisely. Your muscles are silent. And uh, in order to characterize the, this situation, uh, you evoke this uh, suspension of this belief uh, by Coleridge. Uh, the safety distance, uh, uh, recall me uh, Lucrezio's wreckage with spectator, for example. You look at, at the wreckage, but you are safe uh, on, yes. on the bank or uh, on the land. Now, speaking of virtual, um, my feeling is that new media technologies are moving precisely in the opposite way. Yes. They promise in their virtual environments like Oculus Rift, for example. Tomorrow I, I'll quote uh, an advertisement uh, of Oculus Rift uh, promising the magic of presence. And touch screens, they elicit an actual motor action. Yeah. So I was wondering uh, 
how do you modulate this notion of virtual, considering the fact that nowadays virtuality seems to go rather in, in, in the opposite direction than in solarity? It's not only, uh, it's not only the, um, the touch screen, which is certainly important because it adds a novel haptic quality uh, to my uh, uh, experience of film, which is not only the, the standard idea of the haptic quality of images, but there is an actual tactile uh, uh, input uh, which is produced by the fact that in order to play, rewind, enlarge, uh, um, uh, make it smaller, I physically touch the screen uh, with my hand. Also this analogic relationship between the opening of my hand and the enlargement of the image and the squeezing of, of my fingers and the uh, uh, diminishing size of the image is very interesting. But it's even more than that. I mean, in, in such a room, uh, the screen is at best two, three meters away. At home, uh, people recommend uh, never to watch TV uh, less than one meter and a half, two meters away from the screen and indeed, uh, until now, we, we use a, a technology, um, a piece of technology called remote control. Now, for the first time, uh, moving images, we are watching moving images within our peripersonal space. Uh, we handle the device with our hand. Last night, I was looking at uh, the last episode of uh, The Walking Dead was online, and I was like that, with my iPad. So the iPad was approximately 30 centimeters away from my face. We know already that our brain treats visual events differently when they occur within our peripersonal space or outside the peripersonal space. So all of these modulatory effects uh, uh, with the addition of uh, virtual reality may uh, uh, open up a new aesthetic avenue, new forms of uh, aesthetic experience that uh, uh, we begin to, um, to uncover um, as we speak. Much of what I said applies to the standard, uh, which is almost an historical uh, perspective on film. If, if you compare the figures, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the movie theater is, is, is a tiny minority uh, of the technology being used uh, uh, to watch films uh, nowadays. So this is why we are so interested in confronting uh, the proxemics of the filmic experience, the distance and uh, the size beside uh, uh, the, uh, um, the experience being uh, uh, together with other individuals or more. Yeah. Merci. Alors, on a encore trois questions. Donc, euh, il y a, il y avait d'abord le monsieur Mao, après Mildred et après Federica. Donc, je vous demande peut-être... Okay. Um, no, no, I have a question. Je, 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 when they can tell us anything specific about the experience of screens as opposed to the experience of reality. So, just explain. Uh, there are two kinds of claims that you can make about um, what uh, neuro mechanisms would you like to tell us about the experience of film. One is the easy claim. The easy claim is to say there are similarities between our experience of film and the experience of reality. <coughs> that can trigger the neuro, neurons, uh, neuro experience more generally. That's why watching film, watching human agency film can kind of emotionally affect us or appear exposed. That's what the main part of your thought was about, and that seems a safe claim. Um, what seems more difficult is to explain what's the difference, um, the difference which is linked with a specific aesthetic attitude. When we see films in film, we have the sense of attachment, we have a sense of irrealization, we know it's not real, and that's, as you mentioned, that's why in sense we're liberated to respond in an emotionally intense way. Um, but what concerns me is um, it doesn't seem right to suggest that mirroring mechanisms, which were the main focus of the talk, could explain that modification. 
It seems that those are effective kind of responses are continuous with reality. And what we really have to do is don't seem to explain very well is how is it that we, we modify that attitude? How do we adopt an attitude through reality? And that seems to be seems to require a kind of higher level cognitive modification, if you like. Uh, something which we have which we've learned to do, it comes from naturally, but it's sort of cognitive modification of our more basic neural responses. So it's one of the Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, when we speak about neural mechanism, I spoke about mirror neurons, but I could have spoken about the so-called uh, social brain network. Uh, those where many of our colleagues believe uh, are located the modules for mind reading, okay? Uh, it's always looking through a peeping hole. So you focus on one specific aspect of brain function, which doesn't entail that uh, you are dealing with something that operates in isolation. For example, Lisa Azizadeh at USC a few years ago demonstrated that you empathize less and your mirror mechanism is activated less if you are led to believe that the characters you see on the screen are neo-Nazi, uh, and you are not clearly a neo-Nazi. Uh, uh, people who do not share your political views, who are in pain, lead to a lesser uh, degree activation of this mechanism. Who's telling the mirror neuron that that guy is a neo-Nazi? This is well beyond the grasp uh, of this mechanism. It is a top-down modulation exerted by other centers that uh, uh, somehow are dealing with uh, your beliefs about uh, um, someone else, uh, who this specific person is and whatever. Um, so uh, I, I, I tried to, to say it, but uh, probably it was just a, a, a passage. Um, these are not magic cells. There's nothing magic in, in, in mirror neurons. I think this mirror mechanism is the closest neural approximation uh, to what people uh, along the years have been describing as empathy, uh, 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 meet gefühl, then we can, of course, describe the details, the nuts and bolts in philosophical terms, if meet gefühl and einfühlung are the same or not. They're probably not, but nevertheless. Um, so, I don't, I, I didn't make the claim that our aesthetic experience in a film and the fact that we enjoy so much, we are so much moved by something that our rationality is telling us is patently false, uh, is due to embodied simulation. I think that embodied simulation and its modulation uh, as liberated in these specific circumstances can complement the unique uh, uh, um, answer to this question, which is the, the cognitive one. But of course, I mean, there are many, many, many other ways to use the brain. If you go and talk to people at Janico, they will tell you a completely different story, even if they uh, occasionally put people in scanners. But they ask different questions. They have a completely different idea, uh, much more cognitively charged uh, than mine. And so everything is uh, propositional, so the meaning of a, of a movie is what the director mind wants the mind of the spectator to realize, and, and, and uh, that kind of uh, solution. So w whatever we do, uh, it's the whole brain body which is come into play in, with different dynamic uh, connections uh, top-down and bottom-up effects. It's never the outcome of one single mechanism. That applies to vision, it applies to hearing, it applies to anything. So it's not just a specific feature of mirror neurons. <clears throat> Merci. Uh, Mildred Dan. Merci. Comme ça D'accord. Je 
pas. Hein. <rire> bon, alors, merci beaucoup pour votre exposé euh, qui m'a énormément intéressé. Euh, alors, je peux peut-être euh, commencer par une, une remarque ou information euh, par rapport à votre idée de l'insularité de l'expérience esthétique. Alors, effectivement, euh, vous, vous le disiez vous-même, il euh, y a certainement des... des conclusions auxquelles vous arrivez, euh, auxquelles des auteurs du passé sont arrivés par d'autres voies, et vous l'avez bien montré euh, dans, les, dans les références euh, que vous faisiez. Euh, pour cette euh, insularité, donc, euh, alors Lips le dit euh, très très clairement, euh, c'est lié pour lui à sa conception de la contemplation. Euh, en fait, ce qu'il explique, c'est qu'à partir du moment où je concentre toute mon attention sur l'objet dans cette contemplation, ou ce regard attentif, euh, l'objet euh, devient pour moi « built », devient « image ». Donc que ce soit une sculpture, que ce soit euh, quoi que ce soit, euh, il acquiert le statut d'image, euh, c'est-à-dire qu'il est pris en tant que euh, purement apparaissant, ce qui veut dire aussi qu'il est pris en tant que ni réel ni irréel. Euh, le jugement est suspendu, justement, comme hein, dans la formule de Coleridge, euh, sur la question de la réalité ou de l'irréalité de l'objet, et euh, on voit bien comment dans tout le système de Lips, effectivement, il y a une sorte de, de, de focus de toute l'attention euh, qui, qui, enfin, voilà, qui, qui me semble faire écho, euh, l'inverse, euh, à, à ce que vous découvrez, vous, par la voie euh, expérimentale, par cette idée de, de, mmh. voilà, de la mise à disposition de neurones qui euh, sont libérés de, leur, euh, de leurs interactions euh, dans la vie réelle. Euh, alors, on peut poser la question du coup de ce qui favorise cette insularité des formes esthétiques dans les traits de l'objet lui-même. Et ça rejoindrait peut-être la question d'André à laquelle on continue à réfléchir un peu plus tout à l'heure. Euh, voilà, c'est-à-dire qu'il y a des, la manière de, de booster l'activité euh, euh, du système miroir euh, et sans doute lié à des traits de la forme. Et là, on pourrait aussi tabler sur des réflexions euh, personnelles de, de l'esthétique. Merci. Euh, alors, moi, j'ai plus directement des questions, et bon, je suis totalement euh, d'accord avec vous sur l'idée de euh, tout ce qui peut, de favoriser tout ce qui peut aider à montrer que euh, la création de sens n'est euh, pas du tout uniquement cognitive, mais enracinée. Alors, dans là, vous ne prendrez peut-être pas les choses de la manière, mais dans, disons une expérience sensible et affective. Euh, euh, tout ce que vous avez exposé, euh, il me semble, est dirigé essentiellement vers le rapport au personnage au cinéma. C'est-à-dire que bon, la question, c'est le rapport avec autrui, euh, fut-il euh, réel ou euh, filmé ou figuré. Euh, et il euh, y a des applications, en ce moment, il y a des jeunes chercheurs qui travaillent comme ça sur les neurosciences et le système miroir et le théâtre. Et évidemment, ça marche très très bien pour le théâtre parce qu'il y a aussi cette question de la, de la distance. Euh, Beaucoup de formes de théâtre contemporain où on se trouve très près des acteurs et donc ça, ça favorise encore cette, cette mise en interaction. Mais moi, ce que je me demande, c'est est-ce que à partir de, de vos enquêtes, il y aurait un moyen d'expliquer de, comment, enfin, comment dire, si on peut rappeler une espèce d'aplatissement dans le film, euh, peut-être lié justement à la nature de l'écran, euh, consistant en ce que euh, les personnes sont traitées exactement comme les choses, les personnages, les, vous voyez c'est-à-dire que comment on pourrait expliquer, enfin, est-ce que, est que vous, vous, vous voyez des expériences futures ou un aspect de votre théorie qui permettrait d'expliquer par exemple le rapport affectif qu'on a au, au film que je, dont j'ai montré un oui, petit peu oui. la liste C'est très intéressant. Quand vous montrez cette vidéo, j'ai immédiatement pensé à la proposition qui a été faite par the late Daniel Stern oui. of Forms of Vitality. Oui. Forms of Vitality, it's the, um, in his definition, the affective quality uh, of uh, anything that moves. It can be a dancing body, it can be uh, geometrical shapes. Uh, for example, uh, people have been claiming that uh, since uh, the geometrical shapes in the movies by Haider and Simmel, you know, the big triangle chasing the small square. So people, unless they suffer from uh, autistic spectrum disorder, always provide a very rich 
elaborate emotional narrative of those geometrical shapes. There's the bully, uh, uh, the weakest one, and the like. So it can, So the body, there, there is no body to be seen. So it must be cognitive, it must be. And indeed, uh, it's the quality of movement, and people in my department, uh, together with uh, Dan, Dan then unfortunately passed away, started investigating in, in, in a variety of domains. In the domain of action, for example, comparing rude and gentle action. You can give an object in many different ways. Uh, voice, sounds, uh, and uh, not coincidentally, all these different uh, multimodal, uh, nevertheless, same affective qualities are mapped uh, within the insula. So the insula maps the gentle or kindness of an action, of a sound. So it's not so concerned with the sensory modality. I, I was telling um, before to Andrea that the whole brain is a synesthetic, even V1. Uh, the primary uh, visual area can be driven by tactile stimuli. It can, the, the primary auditory cortex can be driven by visual stimuli. Uh, if you touch the hand of someone with the eyes closed, MT, which is the brain area which is uh, tracking moving object in your visual field, is activated, although you don't see anything. You see with the eye of your imagination. So it's not surprising that uh, there are parts in the brain that are so heavily linked with the limbic part of our brain that are able to capture, to derive, this affective quality that can be detected even in non-anthropomorphic stimuli as the one that you showed us. And so, even the, the affective quality of colors, although I was a lot more uh, optimistic about the possible empirical research on that, before reading Eisenstein. After reading Eisenstein, <laughs> my enthusiasm got greatly reduced because he's so incredibly good in showing how uh, the cultural influence can vary uh, the emotional quality of a given color. So green uh, is the eye of Saturn, and at the same time, uh, it's a color of uh, youth, of hope. So uh, Culture has always to be to be factored out uh, in all these uh, kind of approaches, plus inter-individual variability. Merci. Et une dernière question brève, si possible, Frédérica. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much for your very stimulating and passionate lecture. Um, I just wanted to have a clarification. Uh, in a sense, the advantages of adopting your paradigm of the uh, embodied simulation is evident when dealing with characters in the cinematic situation, since uh, what is taking place is a form of uh, social interaction, although mediated. Yeah. And yet, I think a relevant difference between our relation with flesh and blood people and with the character is that the latter um, never give us a feedback because the uh, characters are freeze the static past images. And I just wonder how your, the or your theory deals with this aspect, if you think that this aspect mm, confers a substantial uh, difference in, uh, in quality and how important this difference might be, because it could be argued that the uh, peculiarity of human interaction is exactly the uh, dual directionality that uh, lacks in cinematic situation. Yeah, we, we are, in that respect, I think it, it, it can be hardly challenged, this fact that uh, we are the unique species, or maybe someday we will discover that there are fish that in the depth of the ocean can paint or whatever, but I, uh, I can hardly believe that. We are the species able to uh, mettre an image, uh, like this collab uh, would put it. So. This led me to overemphasize, it's always a matter of uh, focus and emphasis, to overemphasize how similar our dealing with reality and our dealing with uh, 
uh, fictional worlds is. But at the same time, uh, uh, I, so I, I fail to emphasize what makes the two situations different. And, uh, but this can be clearly demonstrated. So there's one the experiment done by uh, Christian Cases and, and called co-workers a few years ago on disgust, the feeling of disgust. Well, they were comparing genuine disgust uh, experienced by participants the observation of someone else disgust, as in my images, watching a video clip uh, showing someone uh, making the disgust face and reading a narrative about the disgust of a fictional character. Again, in all three completely different, phenomenally speaking, situations, there is a kernel which is shared. The anterior insula activates no matter whose disgust uh, if it's real, if it's fake, if it's observed, if it's read. But this area in these three different, uh, very different phenomenal situations connects dynamically and unambiguously with different parts of the brain. Or let's take touch. You touch the hand of someone, this leads to the activation S1, S2, the premotor cortex and uh, the posterior insula, which most likely brings in the affective quality of this tactile experience uh, we, uh, we perceive. When I watch the hand of someone else being touched on screen uh, in a film, in a video, we did this experiment, um, I still see the activation of S1, of S2, of the ventral premotor cortex, although to a much less intense degree of activation, okay? Same area, less activated, but my posterior insula is switched off. I do not derive the same affective activation that I normally get when my body is touched when I watch the affective quality of the tactile experience of someone else. Interestingly enough, schizophrenic patients do not show this switching off of the posterior insula. So you see, the, the border between a rock-solid sense of what is real and what is not, the self-induced delusion derived from watching a film, and the real delusion of a schizophrenic patient share some aspects, but at the same time, they are completely different on other, other respect. And given the time uh, that one can use to, to address shortly this topic, sometimes we, I wanted to emphasize, my job today was to show you how fantasy, imagination, and reality are similar when watched from uh, the point of view of the brain. That was my uh, my job. But if you ask me, but they are different, uh, and then next next talk will be, can be devoted uh, on, on the differences. Thank you for your question. Merci, merci. Uh, okay. Uh,